right, can everybody hear me okay? I don't like speaking into a microphone, but I know I'm not the loudest speaker. Um, yeah, I'm Christine Johnson, and I'm a curatorial associate at the American Museum of Natural History in the Division of Invertebrate Zoology. And today I'm going to talk about the challenges of digitizing or approaching to digitize the wet collection and some of our goals. Um, I'm actually part of a thematic collection network on pin specimens um, with Randall Shu at the American Museum of Natural History and Rob Noxie, who's at the New York Botanical Garden, where we're digitizing plant bugs, their parasitoids, and their host plants. And we actually have a pretty good workflow for pinned insects um, where you know somebody working really hard can actually digitize about 5,000 specimens a month, um, at least with the insects. Um, but I'm now approaching the wet collection from a collections manager, collection manager's perspective, and this is a whole different can of worms, um, no pun intended. Um, so in digitizing the wet collection or the fluid collection, I have, or what I have identified as two primary goals for us. And you'll see as I go on, some, mostly this is all challenges, and that's because we haven't really looked at our wet collection yet and, and made any sort of decisions on what to do. But the first goal of digitizing our wet collection is, you know, from the perspective of administration and the museum and our loan system, it's one, to have a uniform system to track specimens for loans, name changes, historical treatments, whether something is in the or fluid, et cetera. And also to share this data as a means for other people to access our collection and also for, you know, other research purposes such as doing um, meta-analyses, ecological studies, knowledge studies, etc. So I divided the challenges into two sort of perspectives. Um, the collection level perspective and this data collection level. Um, our wet collection, this, what you see here is um, our, the storage space where we keep our wet collections. And this was only built about 15 years ago. And let me just backtrack a little bit. Yeah, about 15 years ago, this, well, the storage facility was built and our division of invertebrate zoology was merged. So we had the, you know, the non-insect invertebrate zoology department and then the entomology department. And we merged, creating this ginormous collection. So all together, we have about 27 million specimens and our wet collection is about 10 million specimens. And all this stuff was sitting in people's offices. These, these things were in hallways. And then finally, the fire department was like, oh my god, you, know, you can't have like you know, 50 cans of alcohol in someone's office. So they built this, this, this space. And we now have our wet collections in this space. Um, we have diverse taxa, obviously, because we're this big conglomerate of insects and non-insects. We've got you know, mussels, spiders, um, scorpions, crustacea. And we even have protists. Um, so dealing with this, um, even though this is a wet collection, we actually have multiple types of preservation methods in this wet collection out of necessity. You have specimens that um, you know, are dry, but then you have the internal parts that are in alcohol, and then you have some other stuff that's on slides. And this is all considered our wet collection. So it's this real big mix of preservation methods that we have to deal with. Um, sometimes you have an entire organism um, in a single <coughs> preservation type, or you have a single or organism that's result preserved in multiple ways. Sometimes they're right next to each other, as you saw there was sometimes alcohol and then the dry part. Or you have a single organism preserved in multiple ways that's actually stored in two different places. So the shells themselves are stored in one area, and then you've got the, the body parts stored someplace else. And then you even have um, associated organisms that are preserved in multiple ways, such as the termite collection. They have their protists, and so we've got the termites and this Kirby collection, and then we have the protists from those termites. And then we only have a number that associates those protists with those termites in some journal somewhere, and there's only a number associated with those specimens. So how do you, you know, deal with all of that? We also have, unfortunately, a mix of organization styles. Not everybody apparently organizes, and this goes back in history a little bit, organizes their collections taxonomically. So we have, in this collection, we have stuff that's organized by number and not taxonomy. So it's a whole nother issue that needs to be resolved before we even start thinking about this digitization process. Fine, you know, we also have then the issue of 
the trade-off between rehousing specimens while we're doing the digitization process and the triage that's needed for some of our collection versus the digitization desire. Once you start digitizing and you start looking at these collections, you realize how much stuff can really be in bad shape, especially when you have 10 million specimens and there are very few people working on these collections. So where do you go from there? Do you rehouse everything while you digitize it? I mean, as you can see in this picture here, in that vial, you probably can't even read the label through that and it needs to be rehoused, which is a whole nother set of um, effort that needs to be um, invested in this in addition, to, in addition to the digitization process. We also have with this collection multiple existing databases and catalogs with pre-existing numbers. How do we deal with that? We have the loans database, we have personal Excel spreadsheets in people's offices, we have you know, a FileMaker Pro database that has some of the catalog stuff, and then we've got some other databases, and some of this material is duplicated in these different databases, because there has been a big general sort of push to, to view this as a global thing, um, you know, institution-wide or division-wide, especially because our division is not relatively um, new. So then you have the, the, the question of choosing a database. Does it fulfill most everybody's goals? You try to think about your database, and some people will want to create a new database or whatever, but um, you know, your needs might not meet the needs of the other people in the division or in that particular collection. And you really do need to think about whether it can fulfill you know, cataloging needs as well as loans needs, and are those needs met to a good extent? Also, do you go with an open source system? Do you go with a proprietary, um, a proprietary database? You know, and then there's also that trade-off. You might get something that is proprietary, but data entry speed is inefficient for, for your needs. And of course, with databasing, we all want to be efficient and have a good, speedy data entry. Um, then you have the choice of levels of digitization. You know, with pinned insects, you know, you can you can kind of do one because there's generally usually one bug, you know, on an insect pin. In the alcohol collection, it's not the case. You can have a single specimen per vial. You might have multiple specimens of the same species per vial. You might have a jar of vials. So at what level do you actually start digitizing these? Do you put in unique specimen identifier numbers for every specimen that's in that late jar, or do you just give it one, one, um, one label? Um, which brings up the whole issue of identifiers. You need to go forward and sort of think, what kind of identifier are you going to use? Is this identifier something that um, um, that will be um, amenable for you depositing your information in these um, resources that IDBio is providing and, and, and GBIF. So these are all things that you really have to think about and can be big challenges, especially if you already have pre-existing numbers and then you're adding another number and how are you going to approach that. And then there's also this whole, the, I, you know, because we have these multiple databases, you know, I start looking at the databases and I see that some of the, the databases have a very different way of storing their information. You have like some will have one cell in the loops. Sorry. Oh, there we go. to migrate any type of data, and that's actually a really good test for yourselves if you haven't started doing any of this yet. Take some multiple databases, see if you can migrate this data into a new database, and you'll see that the way you collect your information is excruciatingly important because you, know, you have people that put the lowest level of the locality first versus people that put you know, the country first, and then you don't have the same, um, same separ separators. So how do you parse that? It's a massive task just even parsing the information in the existing databases so that you can actually move them into something else and make it um, a uniform database. So then, lastly, we have the role of the institution. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but you do need the support of the institution. You really need IT support. You need server space, software, and hardware maintenance because you're working on the digitization and you need someone that's going to take care of that. And we're in some ways, lucky we're a big institution, but you know sometimes people don't want to maintain their servers for you because they have other things that they have. 
They'd rather do like development. Um, so, um, and you also have, you know, sometimes some limitations on the institution-wide goal. What does the institution want? Do they care if you share your information with other people? A lot of times they don't. They just want to know what they have and where their specimens are. And that may limit your choice and how you go forward and what database you use, et cetera. Um, in terms of support staff, and the way I've sort of looked at this is, you know, we have our support staff, and going forward, it's nice to make it at least part of the job description. So you're not only you're not only relying on new people that you hire should you get a grant or volunteers, but try to build this in. So for for us, you know, we, we bring in the loan aspect and the stuff that that appeals to administration. We can use those resources because we're addressing you know two two issues here. So and then the last question for me is when I look at this collection is where to start. I mean, it's massive. Um, do you start with the worst parts of the collection? Do you start with the parts of the collection that need a whole reorganization because it is organized like number and not taxonomy? You're gonna do, you need to do a whole lot of um, staging in order to, um, to start someplace, but you need to find a place to start. And um, that's always a very big, big question. I know so a lot of people who are here, I think, are from ichthyology, and so to me, ichthyology seems simple, but I don't know if that's really true. <laughs>